Welcome back to Self Love Ignited. Today on the podcast, I am interviewing Jenny Ann. This interview is really interesting because Jenny brings a perspective. She comes from the corporate world. She worked in corporate for years, was a perfectionist, pushed herself really, really, really hard, and eventually she burned out. And through this process, she realized that she needed to slow down, get in touch with herself. And that really set her on this path to self-love. And she talks about how this is an ongoing experience. It is always sort of unfolding and changing, but it is a beautiful path that she is committed to and it has absolutely changed her life. Jenny is an empowerment and breathwork coach and a transformation facilitator. She specializes in helping high-performing women transition from the corporate grind into their power, their passion, and their purpose. She stands for our right to never settle and is passionate about unlocking and amplifying the potential that is already in you. I love her work. I love her message. She is a pretty incredible woman, and I'm really excited for you to meet her. Jump on in. My name is Katie Allen, and this is Self Love Ignited. Let's get to it. Welcome back to Self Love Ignited. Today on the podcast, I'm interviewing Jenny. Jenny, I'm really excited to have you here with me here today. Why don't you take a moment and introduce yourself to everybody? Absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited for this conversation and I hope that there's some wisdom or nuggets of gold in there for the listeners to you know maybe take home and resonate with and and put into their own lives but a little bit of an introduction about me I am a empowerment and breathwork coach and really my highest mission is to support women in you know stepping out of corporate grind stepping out of the the sameness and the rinse and repeat that we have in the world right now and stepping into their highest purpose into their passion and really just releasing the potential that is within and i think that where we are now in the world that is such an important thing that we all need to be kind of striving for because we are meant for so much more than than what we think we are and to the topic that you know that you have in the podcast i really believe it all starts with with self love and really connecting to yourself and you know really starting to to appreciate all of the amazing beings that we are um if i talk about my story a little bit about where i'm from because a lot of people hear my accent and they're like where is she from <laughs> and <laughs> i'm a little bit complicated i like to say but I kind of started my journey in Scotland. This is where I grew up as a child. I was also living in Saudi Arabia. Most of my teenage years was in New Zealand, so this is kind of for me where I call home. But now I am living in Germany in a little town. Well, it's kind of a a city they call it, but for me it's fairly small. Um called called Nuremberg. So this is where I've kind of settled for now. And my story really you know, we'll, we'll go into it a little bit later, I'm sure, but my life kind of unfolded in a way that I fell into my corporate job. I fell into this, you know, I just got really good at something. And so I kept on doing it. But along that way, I really, really lost the essence of who I, who I was and what I really wanted. I was so busy pleasing others, being this high performer perfectionist that I really lost track of, of what fulfills me and what makes me happy. And and also loving myself. There was really none of that for a very long time. So now in the work that I do and the people that I get to connect with, life is so much brighter. Life is so much more fulfilling. And I just really wish that for for everybody. That's amazing. Wow. And I think so many, so many women listening are going to really identify with that, like falling into something because you're good at it right? Because how many of us, especially when we're teenagers, it's like, we're, we're encouraged, like, find that thing. What is your thing? And you're like 16 and you don't know your thing. You don't know, but you find something that you are good at something that you're like, well, I guess I don't hate this. And it's easy to just sort of let that take over. So I love that you've sort of broken out of that. And I love that you help other people do that too. That's really, that's incredible work. Mm, thank you. And, and absolutely right. When you're 16, I think unless you're like, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer or, you know, these very kind of um, standard uh, career paths, 
you're really left with a lot of questions. And when you're at school, at least when I was at school, we're not given the full like smorgasbord of career options that are available. And times are changing so much now. There's so many entrepreneurs out there, so many creatives. There's, you know, now we have, especially in the last couple of years, people like diversity, equi- equality and inclusion um, consultants. So there's, there's so much out there that we, we need more time to explore. 16 is way too young. <laughs> way too young. Way too young. So Jenny, let's dive into your story then. I would love to hear sort of, let's like take us back to the beginning like the beginning of your challenges with yourself, where did those begin? And then sort of walk us down that journey, that path of you sort of coming back to yourself and and that self-acceptance, self-love piece. Mm, Absolutely. So I, since working with a coach, I have recently discovered that my core wounds, which we all have, you know, when we're very, very little, something happens to us, we become separated from unconditional love. And my core wound is that I am not perfect. So I am imperfect. So something happened where I I realized that I had to be perfect to receive love. And so a perfectionist was born within me, which, you know, became something that has really driven a lot of my life. And this came down to how I felt about how I looked, my body image, how I performed, you know, the, I was a rule follower. Like I would follow all of the rules exactly to the T because I didn't want to get in trouble. I just followed everything perfectly. But unfortunately this, you know, let's probably start the, the biggest moment was when I was around 18 years old and I was in a very unhealthy relationship where this person was very, Misloyal, dis- disloyal, disloyal, misloyal. Um, when you live in Europe for too long, you forget words. Um, <laughs> dis- disloyal, mm-hmm. and this really left me feeling like I was so worthless. Like because there was no explanation, right? So you'd not given a reason on why someone has acted this way towards you. So you start to self blame, like you turn it back on yourself. It must be me. And what happened here was I was looking at the other women, there were multiple, looking at what they looked like, looking at what they wore, how they presented themselves. And I started to try and shift to be more like that, right? The comparisonitis came in. And unfortunately for me at this time, low self-worth, comparisonitis, it meant that I kind of developed a really bad relationship with food. There was quite some time where I didn't really eat a lot and was very, very small. I think I was down to about 52 kilograms. I mean, I'm, I was about to say six foot four. I am not, I'm five foot two, 164 (laughs) centimeters. Um, But 52 kilograms is not, not a lot for, for a person of 18, 19 years old. And from here, eventually getting out of that relationship was great, but, but this still haunted me. This still followed me into the next relationships in terms of how I really felt about myself. I, I felt like I was broken, like something had broken me and I wasn't good enough for anybody and who would really want me. And this really followed, despite being in some relationships, this followed me up until actually just before I met my now husband, literally before we met, maybe a month before I had taken a decision I'm not going to be in a relationship. Love is not meant for me. I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to like meet people and have a nice time and just enjoy my life and be this single, you know, I had taken this decision because this was a way for me to also protect myself from feeling not good enough because this also became part of my story, right? If I can exclude myself if I reject myself from everybody else, then nobody can reject me because I've done it myself. And this sort of fed into my independence that I, I became super independent, right? Like even when I, when I moved to Europe six, six or seven years ago, I decided I'm going to go to Europe. I sold everything I owned, packed two suitcases, bought a one-way ticket and off I went, you know, didn't need anybody. I'm just going to go and, and do it. And although this is great and a, a lot of This has taught me so much, right? There's so many lessons that we can find through our pain. 
I can follow instructions really well. I can give instructions really well. I can lead people. I'm independent. I resourceful, great things, but it all came through a lot of pain at the beginning, which like I said, really kind of followed me through. Now, if I talk a little bit between that 19 years old to 30, or 19, 20 years old to 30, 10 years, let's just say in those years, I became a smoker. I drank a lot. I partied a lot. I became a goth for a little while. I, like I said, moved to, moved to Europe and I really threw myself into the work. So I was working in retail and, and in corporate um, or, originally for Cotton On, which if you're in Australia, New Zealand, you will know the brand, yep. um, but it's like a fast fashion brand. So I was working for them. I loved it, but I loved it because I was receiving the validation that I was good at it. So I kept going and I kept pushing and working crazy hours. And eventually this led me to my almost just before my 30th birthday, where I had a burnout. And this was a, a accumulation of so many things, not just, I mean, it's the body, body image, the self-love was that was not there. It was pushing myself too hard. It was feeling like I didn't really have any friends here, feeling like I would never find love, feeling really alone, like so many things that can, yeah, just accumulated. And I think this is a, a misconception that we have these days that burnout is purely your career. And it's absolutely not. If you asked for my professional opinion, absolutely not. Burnout can come from so many other things like family stresses, financial stressors. I mean, if we talk about that, I had $45,000 of debt purely because I would get sad and I would go get a loan so I could go visit my friend or buy, I mean, not smart, but when you're in that place of low self-worth, you're just looking for that external thing that's gonna make you feel better for a moment. Mm -hmm. Luckily debt-free now, but um, talking about the burnout piece, it really was a, a very gradual train towards the wall. And I also applied this kind of logic to my health. So I started to try to work on this body image thing, but it was from the wrong energy. It was from, I'm going to run six kilometers in the morning and then go to work for nine hours and then go to CrossFit and then come home. And then I'm going to read a book because that's what smart people do. And then I'm going to journal because that's what I have to do and meditate. And I'm going to, and it was again, this high performer, like applying this high performer approach to trying to feel good about myself, which it didn't work. Shockingly. So that's kind of, Shocking. I know, so shocked. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, but it was, yeah, like, like the burnout was the, the changing point for me, although it still took me a little while because I still applied that same logic to the healing. Right. So it was still like, okay, I hear about this thing called the 5am club. And, and just to kind of put it into like bigger picture, everything I was doing was with the intention of being a better person with finding myself, with reconnecting with myself. But when you have this big barrier in front of you that you can't really see, not sure if anyone can kind of relate to that. You're like, I know where I want to be and I know the steps, but there's something in my heart that is telling me that there's, there's something there. It's like, it's a boulder or for me, I, I feel a lot in my chest, right? A lot of constriction. So if you, if you can't deal with that, we can't just keep doing the externals, like joining the 5 a.m. club and getting up and journaling and running and meditating if we don't do the inner stuff first. And that took me a little while to learn. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I think that this, this is the most important piece, but it takes, because it's the scariest part. Yeah. I can, I can box tick. I can, you can give me a list. I can get that done all day long going inside and sitting with my own shit, like, oof, that's a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the scary stuff. Like, and we really are trained from an early age, I think to like most of us, at least like, yeah, tick the things off the list and get the things done. And especially when you're a perfectionist, you're like, look, I did everything on the list. Look, it's all done. Look how, you know, 
I, I love a good checklist, especially when it's all oh, ticked off, it. like really satisfying, <laughs> but yeah, it's, that's not the real stuff. You can't mm-hmm. actually see the real work, right? It's not, it's not on the outside. Nobody else can see it. It's about you on the inside. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So then, so you found yourself in this place where you were like trying so hard to do all the things you know, you're, you're getting up 5 a.m. and you're running and you're crossfitting and you're doing this and you're journaling and, you know, like you said, applying that same energy <laughs> that you had been using. Yep. <laughs> so, so did you have um, like a breakthrough moment or was it just like a gradual awareness that what you were doing wasn't working and you needed to try something else? You know, as much as I would love to say from a storytelling perspective that I had this grandiose aha moment where the light shone down it absolutely wasn't like that for me but funnily enough I was looking for that because I I was like that sounds amazing I really want that and I think again that's my high performer perfectionist who's like I just want to have it all so good um but for me it was really gradual so so after my burnout I was very lucky that I got to move to Amsterdam for 10 months so I was also removed from the working environment that was really not healthy for me. And this is something I would really highlight to anybody who's who's maybe feeling very stressed is that we can take triggers in two ways. For example, my boss was a trigger for me. See an email from her and it, it would set me off. She's a lovely person on a personal level, but on a, on a business level, we didn't match. And there's only so much work you can do to kind of be like, okay, with that trigger. At some point you have to ask yourself, is this the right environment for me to thrive? Maybe not, so I need to leave it. So I was very lucky that I had this assignment and I was able to go go to Amsterdam and, and work in a different space and be alone. And I was very taken care of by the company, which, which was, was fantastic. But through this period, I, I saw a psychologist for 10 months and I mean, this was a very gradual thing. And there was sometimes at the time where I was like very annoyed with him. We had a whole session on my haircut one time because I went to the hairdressers and she made me look like Brienne of Tarth from Game of Thrones. And it was not like, I didn't <laughs> want it that short. And I, just, <laughs> I was not happy for, I, yeah, for a long time. Um, but it was kind of this very gradual, like I started to get into yoga before I used to laugh, like I've done yoga and I was like, this is hilarious. Of course, it's not meant to be hilarious, but as someone new coming in, you might feel a bit weird, but I got into yoga. I got into journaling in a different way. So I started using the artist's way by Julia Cameron, where it's a fantastic exercise that anybody can do, where basically you wake up in the morning before you do anything, you just write three pages of a, it's a brain dump. It's a stream of consciousness I think when I first started, it was like, this is so stupid. I don't know what I'm doing. I just have to fill this goddamn page. I'm just going to keep on writing, blah, 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 (laughs) really. And this is what you have to do just to get it all out. And and gradually this practice gets stronger and stronger. And I think this was how it really went for me. It just all gradually day by day would, would get better and better. And eventually I started to notice like, oh, I'm not reacting that way anymore oh, I don't feel like so bad about myself anymore. Oh, I can look in the mirror and think like, damn, I look good today. You know, and it was just a very slow thing because there wasn't, I didn't have a goal anymore of losing weight or, you know, having better hair or or any of these external things or having different objects. It was just this gradual kind of way that kind, that really, stepped me really more into myself and all of these practices really brought me home into myself and especially for me was breathwork was a huge one because with breathwork you can really connect to parts of yourself that you didn't even know were there like it's so so powerful but it was really a a gradual thing that came from a place of kindness and being gentle and healing and it's okay if I skip a day And I don't have to do 20 things at once. And actually, this is one thing that could be beneficial for anybody that my psychologist told me was, he's like, three things a day, only three things a day. You go to work, 
You go to the gym, maybe you see a friend. That's it. And I was like, okay, I'll try. <laughs> and, uh, and also to have, he was like, minimum 15 minutes of time for yourself, just for you. Not Netflix, unless you are only watching Netflix. Don't be on Netflix and on your phone. Don't be scroll. Like, just do something for you that makes you really happy for you. And this can take a little while as, again, if you've got this uh, mind that's a little bit in overdrive and you're sitting there, you're just waiting for the 15 minutes to be up, but it takes time and it takes practice. And I think just being gentle with yourself will really bring anybody. It definitely brought me just being gentle back to, to who I am. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Do, do you say, so I use that a lot, like be really gentle with yourself, right? Like we're so hard on ourselves and it's like, just be gentle. Do, was that like a conscious choice? Like, did you have to choose gentleness over and over again? Like to make that sort of more your default? Absolutely. Like it's because we are so, and I, I think so many people can relate. We are so used to this negative self-talk, looking at all the things we did wrong, not celebrating anything that we did right, that we have this negative bias and we're just we're so mean to ourselves. And I know a lot of people talk about it in a way that you wouldn't say that to your best friend. Like, why are you saying it to yourself? And it is a practice and it is taking time. First of all, it's the consciousness of it, the awareness of it. Then, I mean, I love affirmations and mantras and all of this. I'm all about it. But sometimes those are even too hard for people to, to take on. So this is where you can tweak them to say, I'm leaning in to loving myself like I'm willing to try or I'm willing to embrace you know yeah. these kind of words that don't make it so um like such a direction it's a, it's a it's a possibility and I think this is where we can really start and this is where the gentleness comes in and eventually things energetically will shift within you right like you might still have a crap day and you might still make a huge mistake like I made a huge mistake on a Facebook group the other day but I'm not it's no longer beating yourself up about it. It's like protecting your energy. And I think the self-trust comes in here as well. Like once you're a self-love, start to self-trust. Once you have that trust, it's, it's just so different, right? Like it's okay to make mistakes and you're okay with that because you can trust that you're always operating from the highest intention and that we're having a human experience here and sometimes mistakes will happen. <laughs> yeah. 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 I could not agree more. I couldn't agree more. Jenny, this beautiful journey that you have been on and continue to be on, right? Like there's no ending. Um, nope. <laughs> <laughs> do you, like, do you identify when, when you think about yourself and your own journey, do you identify with the term self love or is this, has this been a journey of self-acceptance or self-discovery? Like what, what feels most, most true for you? For me, it's self-love. And actually, when I first started doing this work, I was a self-love coach. Um, but I, 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 I evolved and, and it changed. And for me, the idea of self-love was because there's a, some people think self-love is self-care, which if that's what you feel, all good, like your life. For me, self-care is an action. It's a doing. You make the cacao and you have a little ceremony for yourself. You take the hot shower and use essential oils, whatever it is that is self-care for you. Self-love is a way of being. It's how you are being within your body. It's how you are choosing to live your life. Like, are you having relationships that are in a way of like a self-love relationship, not just with yourself, but with others? How are you showing up for, for everything within your life? And are you choosing from the heart and the heart is so powerful like if you go to the heart math institute talking not just in a sense of like oh love and the heart but scientifically the heart is so freaking powerful it can sense emotions before your brain senses emotions it's like a few seconds beforehand so i think the heart is really the place where we can start to really be live from self-love does that make sense? 
Yep. Sometimes I feel like I. No, that was good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now you get like, yeah, you gave me goosebumps there when you were talking about that and how powerful the heart is. And you're right. Like self-love is quite often misconstrued as self-care. And I like to say that self-care are, that, that is like an act of self-love, but that yeah. is not self-love, right? Like it is deeper. It is an inside job it's yeah it's the way you treat yourself Mm -hmm. and speak to yourself and the choices you make and everything that you just said and and I think that the more of us talk about that I think because self-love is like almost like a buzzword in a lot of ways right because people just think it's like fluffy and superficial Mm -hmm. and because that's what a lot of people think it is but I don't and you don't (laughs) you know it's a much much deeper yeah and I think like the self-care acts are so fantastic to offer you a space in the day to come into yourself right it's an act that brings you back but the self like we just said the self-love is how you're being all of the time yeah. but the self-care can help you just to like fill up your self-love tank if that's what you want to call it but yeah, yeah they are different they are different Yeah, they definitely are they are so Jenny tell us a little bit more about the work that you do now and and how has this journey of self-love impacted the work that you do because I know it has inevitably it has in some way (laughs) of course yeah okay so I think when I had when I had this burnout right and I'd spent so many years also being in corporate like this is not for me I don't want to do this for my whole life like I don't have any I didn't have ambitions in terms of so I was a senior manager in in a very big sports company didn't have any amb- real ambitions to become a director because I was so tired of all the, the politics and it just wasn't a space for me. And I just kind of realized like, you know, speaking with my teams and many, many people within the companies and even friends who work for other companies in other countries, it was so clear that I wasn't alone <laughs> in like feeling that this wasn't the path. And this was when it it just kind of really unfolded. I think I'd read a quote from Tony Robbins. I can't even remember which one it was. I mean, he has a lot of great, oh no, it was the, where your attention goes, energy flows. Mm. And I think this was a a quote that kind of changed my, my thought in terms of where I'm putting my energy because it was just like scattered. And so by, by going on this journey, it's really fed into the work that I do fed into the certifications that I've got and just really like it's felt so I feel empowered when I can help other women to become more empowered and it feels so aligned within me that you know by taking that step out of the corporate and into what I do now with helping women it's a lot of people you know would say oh it's a risk and are you sure and you know Dada, what's your backup plan like I don't have a backup plan because this is it like this is there's no question marks there and, and I think um of course like everybody has their own stories and everybody has their own experiences that we can u- always use any of those to take lessons and kind of apply it to a lot of different different things um but with mine specifically and, and especially now with burnout being such a big thing in the world like such a big topic it I really believe that the work that I do is just so important like so important to to help people on on many different levels as well but just to help people to reconnect and come back to themselves and and live a better life and uh, one thing I would say is that you know we have a the coaching industry is massively growing which is a beautiful thing because we could all use you know more support in this sense but even if you're like I would really just love to have a flower shop and do flower arrangements all day long like amazing go do that and I think uh, when it comes to kind of deciding about passion and purpose and sorry I feel like I'm going on a little tangent but like this is important it's Alan Watts in one of his um, talks if you don't know Alan Watts go listen to him he's wonderful Um, he talks about what if money was no object you know what would you do if if money was no object and he's like do that because you're going to be working to get to the next thing you know to find like you're just living for your weekends living for your holidays but if you're doing what you're really passionate about like 
you're good. The money doesn't matter, you know, because yeah. money is the thing that, that we all stress about. And I, I think for this, this is just such a beautiful kind of encouragement to really look within. And at the end of the day, if you are worried about money, everything can be monetized. You just need to have a good relationship with money, which a lot of us don't and do your money mindset work and your money, like just understanding the energy of money, but anything could be monetized. <laughs> it totally can. <laughs> There was, it was a while back. I think it was last year. I remember looking online and there was like a gold plated paper clip for like mm -hmm. somebody was selling it for thousands of dollars. It was like $2,000 or something. And it was literally just a paper clip with gold on it. There was nothing. There you there. go. But it was like <laughs> a brand and somebody like said that it was a thing and like people were buying it. Right. So it's like, you can monetize anything. I know I'm right there with you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of people kind of step away from the money topic. They feel like it's a bit ugh and icky. And like, especially if you're in the spiritual communities, it's like, oh no, but I don't, I don't agree with that. Like money is a tool that we can use not only to support our own freedoms in a way, but also to help others. Like one of my dreams would be to set up some sort of charity that helps, you know, homeless people on the street to set up a cafe and they could have a farm where they can go work at a farm and get set up. And, you know, it's part of a community. This is a huge dream. This would be amazing. Yeah. And having money helps you to do that. <laughs> so yeah. and that's also about giving back, right? Yes. Yes. And, and especially for you, you know, with talking about burnout and so many people are in this place and part of burnout, like you mentioned earlier, is that financial piece, right? Like people are doing jobs that they hate. They're stressed out about money. They're not enjoying their lives. And it's part of self-love really is asking yourself, what do I want? What makes me happy? How can I do that? And yeah, living your dreams and doing, doing those amazing things that everybody sort of looks at you and goes, huh? And it doesn't matter because you know, in your heart that it's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and to your point there and with burnout, you know, a lot of people are working many, many more hours than they are contracted to work. Some countries you may get that time back, other countries you may not, or companies or whatever. And, you know, a lot of people have asked me how I kind of made the shift because I was doing like 60 hour weeks, like working all the time. I said, I had to make a choice. I had to start saying no, that pissed people off, but I had to stand up for myself and say, okay, you want me to do that? Well, what don't you want me to do? You know, to my boss, what's not, what's not on the table anymore? Because I need to go home at five, six o'clock and I'll come home. And then I'd start working on my coaching business at that time when, you know, so it's also about making that kind of commitment to yourself to set your boundaries mm -hmm. and what's really important to you, mm -hmm. because it's not a smooth sailing road at the beginning for anyone who makes, wants to make the shift. And I don't say that to scare anybody, just the reality is like, it might take time. Some people get really lucky. Some people know the right people, whatever it is. But for the majority of us, it's, it takes hard work. But when your vision is so much higher than you, and I know a lot of people say this, but they say it because it's true. When it's so much higher than you, not doing it is not an option. Yeah. A hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah. So Jenny, if there is somebody listening who is sitting there nodding along and they can really see themselves in your story. Maybe they're where you were a few years back, right? Like in corporate, struggling with burnout, not listening to themselves, not honoring themselves. Is there one tip or exercise or like one thing that you would recommend they start with? Mm, good question. What could they start with? You know, I think the best place for anybody to start is to really get out of their head and into their heart. And that could, I know that's a vague answer, but that could look a little different for anybody. For me, yoga is a perfect way. Yoga is my sacred pause. You know, this is my time. I'm on the mat. Nothing else matters for you. It could be taking a walk in nature, but without your phone, preferably <laughs> it could be breath work. There's so many online and free breath work sessions that people can take that really supports you to really come into yourself and breath work. Like I was saying, it's very powerful to connect a lot to the spiritual, but also to the emotional side within you. 
and you might start to find answers. And when you're doing any of these things, whatever it is that really brings you into your heart, I would just say, start with an intention. And it doesn't have to be, what am I going to do with my life? Something small. It could be, your intention could be, how do I want to feel this week? How do I want to feel? Maybe I want to feel like really deep joy. Maybe I want to feel like playful. And then start to build some things into your week that give you that emotion, that give you that experience. And this way, it's very easy to start to, first of all, connect back to yourself and what you want, but you're really giving yourself what you want. And this is building energy. This is building boundaries and strength within so that when it comes to those bigger things, you have that energy to to make decisions from a more heart-centered place, which is where we all need to start. Mm, That's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. Yes. Okay. We are going to leave it there because that is absolutely perfect I couldn't think of a better place to leave it (laughs) so Jenny thank you so much for coming on and joining me today thank you for sharing your story and your wisdom and I'm just I'm really really grateful for you thank you thank you so much this was amazing All of the links mentioned during the episode are down in the show notes. Please make sure to go on over and check them out. Also, please remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And I would be forever grateful if you would go on over and leave us a review on iTunes as well. That's going to help this message reach more women. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Here is to you loving yourself.